you. Hello, Internet viewers. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer. Well, this is it. The moment you've all been waiting for. Today is the 30th anniversary of Sonic the Hedgehog. And to help celebrate, how about we review another Sonic game with the Blue Blur himself. Sonic, welcome back. Hey, no problem, gamer. So what game are you reviewing now? I'm glad you asked. For your birthday, Sonic, we'll be talking about... Wait, what's going on? Don't worry, Sonic. I know that sound from anywhere. Why, it's... Hello, Lucas. Yeah, I knew it. Hello, Seth. To what do I owe this visit? Again. Oh, not much. But I see you've been reviewing Sonic games lately. Yes, and? And you didn't even invite me. Foolishness, Lucas. Foolishness. You do remember that I'm also called the Fairly Odd Gamer, right? I know, but I got tired of calling you that, so I'm gonna call you by your real name now. And hey, you kept calling me by my real name, so yeah. Fair enough. So, why are you here? Well, allow me to explain. Sonic the Hedgehog is one of my favorite video game series of all time, easily in my top three. I've been a fan of the Blue Blur for over a decade, but my first exposure to the franchise was actually one of the animated series, that series being Sonic X. Back when I was only eight years old, I didn't even know he was a popular video game character, all I thought was he was just a cool blue hedgehog who ran very fast. But after playing the original Sonic the Hedgehog via my mom's mobile phone, I was surprised to learn that he's been a famous video game character ever since the early 90s. Eventually, I would play Sonic Rush for the Nintendo DS, which was my first modern Sonic game. It also had a heavy impact on what I believe a great Sonic game should be like, because the reason why I love Sonic is because it's not just about going fast. You gotta look good doing it and show off your style. Then I would play a demo of Sonic Unleashed at a Target, resulting it being my first 3D Sonic game. And then in late 2010, after receiving Sonic Adventure 2 Battle from my uncle, receiving Sonic Colors from my mom for Christmas, and re-watching some episodes of Sonic X, that's when I truly considered myself a Sonic fan. Well, I'm glad to be greeted by another fan of my games. Huh? Who are you and what have you done with Sonic? Whoa, whoa, easy there! Don't you recognize me? I'm Sonic! Sonic the Hedgehog! No way, Sonic is nowhere near as tall. You must be an imposter. Whoa, take it easy there, Seth. Imposter or not, can you please spare him? I actually need him for this review. Hmm. Very well then. But I've got my eye on you. Anyway, I will be joining you for this review. Alrighty then! With that said, let's take a look at... Sonic Unleashed? Um, I've only finished the Wii version, so maybe another time. Sonic Rivals? I have neither the PS Portable nor the PS Vita, so... Nope. Sonic Adventure 2? I already did that one. Hmm, alright. Well, how about Sonic Heroes? Perfect! Let's do it! Let's blast through with Sonic Speed! Okay! Alright, huh? Hey, that's my line! Believe it or not, Sonic Heroes was the first 3D Sonic game I ever played. Yet, before Sonic Adventure DX, I played this. Keep in mind, this was back when I only had the GameCube, and it's still my main console to this very day. I remember running this game in a nearby blockbuster back when they were around, and I enjoyed the heck out of it. During that time, I've had my fair share of classic Sonic games such as Sonic 2 and 3, and even 3D Blast. It was awesome getting to see Sonic in a 3D environment for the first time. Eventually, I managed to get my copy of Sonic Heroes via Amazon, and I still enjoyed the heck out of this game. Even though I beat this game before, the last time I beat it was for a commentary I did years ago. And until its review, I haven't even touched that game. The first time I've ever played Sonic Heroes was actually when I borrowed a copy from a neighbor back in early 2007, just a couple of months after I first got my GameCube. I remember liking it back then, but I also remember being pretty annoyed at the later levels in the game. I'll talk more about that later. Regardless, I would eventually get my own copy of the game sometime after. I definitely have a lot of fond memories of this game, so I'm looking forward to revisiting it. For this review, we'll be looking at the version that both of us own, and that is the GameCube version. While none of us have any experience with the Xbox version, the PS2 version is considered the worst version due to its longer load times, lower frame rates, and more collision issues. But how is this game compared to the adventure games? Let's find out. 
The game opens up with a title screen with the game's theme song playing, though waiting a few seconds on the title screen will trigger the game's normal intro. In my honest opinion, the FMVs look much better in this game than the Adventure games. Like Adventure 1, the opening cutscene lets everyone know what you expect to see in this game, including the return of a villain that we haven't seen since Sonic CD. Well, technically since Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut, but yeah, you get the idea. Unlike the Adventure games where you control a single character, Sonic Heroes has you control four different teams consisting of three characters each. Team Sonic with Sonic the Hedgehog, Miles Tails Prower, and Knuckles the Echidna. Team Dark with Shadow the Hedgehog, Roos the Bat, and Newcomer E123 Omega. Team Rose with Amy Rose, Big the Cat, and Cream the Rabbit, the latter who actually first appeared in Sonic Advance 2. And finally Team Chaos with Estio the Chameleon, Charmy B, and Vector the Crocodile. With Mighty the Armadillo nowhere to be found. Each team has their own separate story, but they all go through the same stages with the same boss fights, but the experience is slightly different depending on what team you choose. Team Rose is considered to be the easy mode. Team Sonic is considered to be the normal mode. Team Dark is considered to be the hard mode. And Team Chaos is a bit of a wild card in terms of difficulty because their level objectives are, for the most part, completely different from the other three teams. That being said, let's talk about how the story begins for each team. Team Sonic's story begins with Sonic running through this canyon with Tails and Knuckles flying in the Tornado 2 from Sonic Adventure. Tails gives Sonic a letter from Dr. Eggman, or a video letter per se, that says he's created the ultimate weapon and plans to conquer the world in three days. And just like that, Sonic begins his new adventure as Tails and Knuckles follow him after jumping out of the Tornado 2. Team Dark's story begins with Rouge infiltrating one of Dr. Eggman's abandoned bases searching for Dr. Eggman's secret treasure. And what does it turn out to be? Why, it's Shadow the Hedgehog, of course, and it turns out that he survived his fall from space in the events of Sonic Adventure 2. How did he survive, you may ask? Well, we certainly don't find out in this game, I'll tell you that. After Shadow awakens, he's suddenly attacked by one of Dr. Eggman's creations, a robot named E-123 Omega, who happens to be the last of the E-Series robots. After a short fight, Rouge manages to stop them from attacking each other so they can talk things over. Omega is angry at Eggman for abandoning him and having his power wasted, so he swears revenge on his creator and is willing to destroy him by any means necessary. Shadow, on the other hand, is suffering from amnesia, so he doesn't remember who he is or anything that happened in the events of Sonic Adventure 2. And so, Rouge decides to team up with Shadow and E-123 Omega so they can hunt down Dr. Eggman to get some answers? Wait, what? Rouge was clearly there during the events of Sonic Adventure 2, so clearly she should know what happened, right? Why doesn't she just tell Shadow everything that happened before she found him? Is she suffering from amnesia too? This is just a guess, but maybe Gunn decided to wipe her memory of the Space Colony Arc incident after her mission was completed. That's the only explanation I can think of as for why she doesn't say anything. But hey, that's just a theory. A GAME THEORY! Team Rose's story begins with Amy reading a newspaper about... Sonic taking hostages? I'm Sonic the Kidnapper! But the strong wind causes the paper to blow away from Amy only to have it saved by Cream the Rabbit. But the wind blows hard enough to where it lifts Cream into the sky. Luckily she's saved by Bid the Cat, back with his fishing rod and everything. After noticing Froggy and Cheese's friend Chocola in the photo, they decide to go out and find them. Team Chaotix's story is just them needing money to pay the rent, so they receive a job from a mysterious client that can hopefully help them with their financial trouble. Who is that mysterious client, you may ask? Well, you'll just have to wait and find out. Let's get started with the first level of the game. Well, for Team Rose, anyway. Seagate! Hello! I'm Omocho! Not again! Yep, Omocho is back in this game. And this time, he's even more of a pain to listen to. And to make matters worse, you can't even abuse him. Fortunately, Team Rose is the only team that forces you to play the tutorial in their story. If you choose any of the other teams, you'll instead be transported to the actual first level of the game, Seaside Hill. Unlike the adventure games, Sonic Heroes focused entirely on one gameplay style, high-speed platforming, which means no mech shooting, no treasure hunting, no fishing, and no chow garden. Each character for each team showcases a different style of gameplay, speed, flight, and power, and they're all self-explanatory, for the most part. In flight formation, he or she has to carry the entire team while flying. Which does beg the question, why can't I just control the flight character alone instead of carrying the entire team? There are levels where you can do that, but only on rare occurrences. The speed characters can not only move really fast, 
but they also have the homing attack as well as a tornado attack to stun enemies and remove shields from certain enemies. There's also the light dash, but only half the speed characters have that ability, those characters being Sonic and Shadow. But it's best to use it in mid-air rather than on the ground since it's most reliable in mid-air. They also have the triangle jump allowing you to jump between walls. Espio can also use this ability and can even stay on walls, unlike Sonic and Shadow. But Amy Rose doesn't get that ability at all. Instead she can hover for a few seconds with her Pico Pico hammer by holding down the jump button. Espio also has an ability unique to him that allows him to turn invisible. Also this is the first Sonic game to give enemies health bars. This brings up the power characters, which are the strongest characters and most fitting for destroying bigger and tougher enemies. And before I forget, the fly characters can attack enemies with Thundershoot whether to stun enemies or obliterate enemies if they're strong enough. Each character can also be leveled up to three times by collecting these blue, yellow, and red spears from random defeated enemies or by hitting checkpoints. The higher their level, the stronger they are. It's always best to get everyone to level 3 as soon as possible so they can defeat enemies much faster than usual. Also, when collecting rings or attacking enemies, you'll fill up this meter that can also allow you to use the Team Blast. When you use it, it completely wipes out every enemy on screen while also doing major damage to any boss fights. And depending on your team, it also comes with a certain after effect. Team Sonic can use the light speed attack after jumping, though it's way more effective in flight formation. Team Dark can stop time with Chaos Control, and Team Chaotix can earn rings for every enemy they destroy with their Team Blast. But Team Rose easily has the best Team Blast out of all four teams, because not only do they destroy everything around them, but they also gain invincibility, a shield, and gain a level for all three characters. Returning from Adventure 2 are bonus points, which you earn after completing cool actions like destroying a bunch of enemies, a light speed dash, or passing through these rainbow rings that allow each character to perform a special pose, including Shadow who dabs. With that said, Seaside Hill is a nice beginner level. This is what happens when you mix Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1 and Emerald Coast from Sonic Adventure, mainly for the beach aesthetic alone. Oh, and this stage also has moving ruins whenever you approach them. Also, this game introduces these cart sections, I don't know what they are exactly, as you travel along a pathway while avoiding obstacles like spike balls and lasers. Like in Adventure 2, you complete the level by reaching the goal ring, and you're once again ranked based on how fast you complete the level, the amount of rings you collect, and your overall score. That is, unless you're playing as Team Chaotix. Okay, you are still ranked at the end of a stage like the other teams, but they clear their levels completely differently from the other teams depending on the level. In the case of Seaside Hill, they need to find 10 Hermit Crabs scattered throughout the level in order to progress. Team Chaotix's missions are all over the place in terms of difficulty. Some aren't so bad at all, while others are tedious and boring. More on that later. And while we're at it, let's talk about the voice acting. Most of the voice actors from the Adventure games reprise their roles for this game, with the only exception being Tails. And let's be honest here, the Tails voice actor for this game is, well, not very good at acting. Come on man, he was just a kid when he was acting. Sure, I may have disliked his performance back then, but nowadays I'm willing to cut him some slack. Especially since now I can tell that Tails is being voiced by a kid in this game. It also makes sense since Tails is, well, 8 years old according to the manual. Plus this is the first Sonic game where the characters talk during the stages. Sometimes they are helpful, while other times they point out the obvious. Most notably Tails. I'm falling! Sonic Heroes easily has the most memorable dialogue from this era of Sonic games, but not for reasons you might think. You're going to hear a lot of the same dialogue throughout the stages so you may or may not be annoyed depending on your tastes. Look at all those X-Men robots! I'll take care of them! Useless heaps of metal. I'll eliminate them all. Tails and Knuckles probably have the most quotable in-game dialogue by far. In fact, whenever Knuckles throws a single punch, he sounds like he's saying... Well... Shit! 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 Whoa! Watch your language there, Knuckles! Something I forgot to mention is that for every team's story, you go through two stages and a boss fight in a different area each time, similar to the classic Sonic games. That being said, let's move on to the next level, Ocean Palace. This is a level that introduces a new moveset that only works on the power formation, the Triangle Dive. Or Big's Umbrella if you're playing as Team Rose, or Vector's Bubblegum if you're playing as Team Chaotix. Despite the visual differences, they all work exactly the same. By approaching a fan, you can have your team glide to higher ground. Another thing to do in Power Formation is to open a stone door by beating it up two times. After a few turtle platforms, as well as Team Sonic and Dark being chased by Spike Boulders if you're playing as them, you'll eventually clear the level. If you're playing as Team Chaotix, you'll have to find and rescue a child near the end of the level. 
The child basically serves as the goal rank for this level, so it's pretty much a normal level, even for them. After every team finishes Ocean Palace, they then encounter Dr. Eggman for the first boss fight of the game, Egghawk. Oh, and you get a short in-game cutscene before the boss battle begins. So, you're the ones who are playing games with my army? Sorry, just part of the job. That's the evil genius, Dr. Eggman. Doctor who? It's a simple boss fight. All you do is attack it while moving or rotary attack. The best way to defeat it is to use the power character. Although you can also use a speed character for the homing attack, but that's about it. After defeating the Egghawk, Eggman says this. This isn't the end! We then move on to the next level, Grand Metropolis. This is probably one of my favorite levels in the game, if only because of how fast you can move thanks to these blue roads that propel you forward. Plus, I just really like the futuristic city aesthetic. This is also the first level to have not only rail grinding, returning from Sonic Adventure 2, but also these poles that the speed characters can swing around by using the tornado attack on them. Though if you have the speed character at level 3, you can simply use the homing attack on them to instantly swing around them. So yeah, this level is really awesome. However, if you're playing as Team Chaotix, you have to find and destroy every single enemy in the level. If you happen to miss even one, you'll have to loop back around the stage to find the one you missed. As a result, Team Chaotix can easily have the worst stage length in the game because of how tedious some of their missions can be. So yeah, fun as Team Sonic, Team Dark, and Team Rose, but not so much as Team Chaotix. Up next, we have the power plant. Not only does this level take place in a nuclear power plant filled with upward energy paths, green sphere-like cages to roll through, and an energy-powered elevator, but we also have fireballs that are easy to avoid and platforms that rise after defeating enemies. Plus, with Team Sonic and Team Dark, there's a section in which you have to make your way to the top while trying to avoid rising lava. The amount of times I've died in here during my first playthrough is uncountable, but I've been able to get it done very easily after a couple of times. If you're playing as Team Chaotix, you'll have to find and destroy three gold turtle robots in order to clear the level. Though fortunately, they're pretty easy to spot and are usually on the main path. Though you'll have to destroy every other enemy in the area in order to open the cage they're inside of. We then get an FMV cutscene that shows one team running into another team. In this case, Team Dark runs into Team Chaotix and Team Sonic runs into Team Rose. Though sometimes the reasoning on why they want to fight is just plain silly. Yeah, I have to agree with that last part. In fact, the only reason why Team Dark and Team Chaotix fight is simply because Rouge picks a fight with them and accuses them of getting in their way. And Team Rose? Well... Gotcha! My darling Sonic! Amy, what are you doing here? Sonic, this time there's no way out of marrying me! Uh, Amy, I don't think beating up Sonic will actually help with marrying him. Yeah, what he said! Besides, what kind of girlfriend beats up the one she loves anyway? Anyway, the team battles are pretty chaotic, no pun intended. The opposing teams behave pretty much how a player controls them, and as a result, it mostly comes down to who can hit each other more. It's basically a defeat them before they defeat you sort of situation. My advice? Spam the tornado move or thunder shoot if you want a good chance at defeating them. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but at the end of a boss fight or team battle, the characters will say different and unique lines that you wouldn't hear from being the normal stages. No! Moving on to the next level, Casino Park. This city reminds me of Casino Opolis. Oh right! This is the game where Team Rose calls back to events from Sonic Adventure. Hey, maybe that's why Cream the Rabbit made these cameos in the DX port. Anyway, remember Casino Night Zone from Sonic 2 in which it was a platforming level with pinball sections? Well, now we have a level like that, but this time in 3D. And what can I say about it? As someone who typically enjoys pinball, the pinball physics in this game are all over the place. Even when I'm using the flippers, the ball doesn't behave the way I'd like it to, unlike the pinball sections in Sonic Adventure. If that game does pinball physics very well, then why couldn't this game do the same thing? It still bugs me to this very day, and I just can't quite put my finger on it. Also, returning from Casino Night Zone is compulsive gambling via slot machines, in which you can either win or lose rings depending on what the slot machine lands on. You're definitely going to want to take advantage of these slot machines if you're playing as Team Chaotix, since their mission for this level requires collecting 200 rings in order to proceed. Or in my case, use Team Blast whenever you approach a group of enemies, therefore earning more rings. Moving on to the next stage, we have Bingo Highway. Contrary to popular belief, this is actually one of my favorite levels in the entire game. I love the visuals, the music, and it feels like a flashy roller coaster ride to me. And sure, it may not control too well, but I've personally gotten used to how the pinball controls are. 
Maybe that's why I enjoy it more than others? I don't know. But regardless, I personally always have a good time with this stage. Although if you're playing as Team Chaotix, you'll have to find 10 out of 20 casino chips in order to proceed. Eventually they all run into Eggman as we go to the next level, Robot Carnival. It's pretty much an enemy rush in which you have to defeat waves of enemies until Eggman decides to end the level by saying this. Don't get too excited boys! Those were the easy ones! He'll even say that if you're playing as Team Rose, which actually consists of two girls and only one boy. There are also times in which the subtitles have spelling errors. For example, before Robot Carnival with Team Chaotix, Dr. Eggman says, You've made quite a mess here. Whereas the subtitle mistakes quite with quit. I can assume that some of the subtitles weren't all proofread, but that's just me. Up next we have Rail Canyon. As the name implies, you are rail grinding for most of the level. And while the rail grinding is handled much better here than Adventure 2, I don't think it's perfect by all means. Eh, I personally don't think the rail grinding was really improved in this game. It still works, but it also still has the occasional issue where you try to switch rails, only for Sonic and company to jump over the rails instead of onto the rail. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's certainly annoying when it does happen. That being said, here's a hint for switching rails in both this game and Sonic Adventure 2. Don't try switching rails while you're trying to speed up. You're more likely to jump over the rail rather than onto the rail if you're still accelerating on the rail. Also, by touching these switches, grinding or not, the direction of the rails changed from blue to pink in order to progress through the level. It's also worth mentioning that this is one of the only levels where Team Chaos's mission is just simply reaching the goal ring, much like the other teams. Moving on to the next level, Bolt Station. While there's not as much rail grinding as there is in Rail Canyon, it does show teams being fired out of a cannon as well as destroying an engine core from a train. I guess you could say that the teams are on the right track? Oh, and remember what I said earlier about the subtitles not being proofread? Well, in the case of Team Dark... Which way is the cannon facing? The subtitles clearly said which way is cannon facing. Sheesh, this is getting into Mega Man X6 levels of grammatical errors. Also, Team Chaotix's mission for this level requires finding and destroying 30 out of 50 capsules in order to proceed. Not much to say about it, so yeah. This leads to the next Eggman boss fight, Egg Albatross. Unlike the previous Eggman fight, it's a three-tier boss battle in which you destroy three portions of Eggman's ship, with the Egghawk being the final tier. However, it neither stops nor performs the rotary attack unlike last time. You can destroy Eggman's ship with the different formations as intended, or go the dangerous route and spam the homing attack for all three portions of the ship. Eventually they destroy the Egg Albatross, only to find out that the Eggman they were fighting was a fake the entire time. It's a fake? I guess Dr. Eggman was learning from Dr. Wily when he decided to use that method. By the way, should I also address the conspicuously broken Shadow Robot clone? No? Alright, maybe later. It's also worth mentioning that when Team Sonic and Team Dark leave the area, we see Metal Sonic appearing to be collecting some data. More on that later. Moving on to the next level, Frog Forest. This is another one of my favorite levels in the game. Mostly because it's one of the more open levels in the game, and I love the amount of speed you can get. Especially on these loops and corkscrews. You can also ride on these flowers to proceed through the level as well. Also, if you're thinking that this is where Big finds Froggy, you're wrong. These frogs only exist to make it rain and cause new plants to grow so the teams can proceed. That is, unless you're playing as Team Chaotix. Their goal is to reach the end of the level without getting spotted by the frogs. If you're caught, well... And by from the beginning, he means from the previous checkpoint, thankfully. On to the next level, Lost Jungle. While the level does have these rain commanding frogs, this level also introduces these black frogs that command acid rain that kills plants as well as causing these fruits to fall from where they're growing. Not to mention these fruits can easily kill enemies. Beaten by fruits, how weak they must be. You said it, Omega. Also, if you're playing as Team Sonic and Team Dark, they finish the level by swinging on vines while being chased by a giant crocodile. If you're playing as Team Chaotix, you'll have to find 10 out of 20 Chow in order to clear the mission. So yeah, very similar to how Seaside Hill and Bingo Highway were handled for them. After clearing Lost Jungle, we're then taken to another team battle. Sonic and friends run into familiar faces from Adventure 2, in addition to another character they've never seen before. Hmm. Didn't you know? We have a date with Eggman too! Is that so? Well then, it'll be a date to die for. Hey! That's my line! Meanwhile, Team Rose runs into Team Chaotix. This fight mostly starts because SVO mistakes Cheese for one of the chow they were looking for back in Lost Jungle. 
Anyway, both team battles are pretty much the same as the previous ones, except this time we hear loop versions of the opposing team's theme songs during these battles. It's also worth mentioning that this is the last team battle in the entire game, so unfortunately, we never get Team Sonic vs. Team Chaotix or Team Dark vs. Team Rose. Unless you're playing the multiplayer mode, but we'll talk about that later. Up next, we have Hang Castle. First off, I love the music used in this level. It has a haunting quality that fits perfectly with a level like this. It's also noted that the soundtrack version combines both the normal version and the inverted version whenever the castle turns upside down. Yep, you can make the castle turn upside down by running into these spherical switches. Not to mention there's pumpkin ghosts that are not as annoying as the ghosts from Adventure 2, and even these wizard robots that can restore the robot's health. This level is surprisingly really fun. I'm usually not big on Haunted Mansion levels and platformers, but this is one of the few that I actually really like. I especially love this last section for Team Sonic and Team Dark where you run down this tower. However, if you're playing as Team Chaotix, it goes from what was once a very fun level to an annoying slog. You basically need to find all 10 keys hidden throughout the level in order to proceed. Miss even one, and you'll have to loop around the stage to find the one you missed. And if you thought it couldn't get any worse for Team Chaotix, just wait until we reach the next level. This leads to my least favorite level in the game, Mystic Mansion. Why is it my least favorite level? Well, allow me to explain. You have all four teams trying to escape the mansion while trying to defeat enemies, grind on these spire-like rails, and to top it all off, having Team Sonic and Team Dark endure a trio of tests via altars. Team Sonic has you make your way to the center while defeating a certain number of enemies, with Sonic having the most difficult path in which you have to homing attack a path of ghosts over a bottomless pit in order to make it to the center. You don't have to travel over the bottomless pit with Team Dark, but you still have to defeat enemies while on tiny platforms. But the worst mission in this level has to go to Team Chaotix. What makes Team Chaotix's mission for this level so terrible is that it requires you to find and blow out all 60 red torches. Yes, you heard that correctly, 60 torches. It's just as long and tedious as it sounds. Worst mission in the entire game by far. Though if you're playing as the other teams, I personally don't think this level is that bad. I think it's a perfectly fine level as Team Sonic, Team Dark, and Team Rose, though I will agree that the last section with Team Sonic can be very annoying if you don't know the game's mechanics well enough. After all four teams escape the Mystic Mansion, they run to Eggman again as we head to the next boss level, Robot Storm. It's similar to Robot Carnival, except you transition from one area to another, whether by switch or cannon. Also, the level starts off with this cutscene if you're playing as Team Chaotix. There you are, you mustache moron! He's the one, right? Mustache moron? I'm the one that's <laughs> Is that supposed to be foreshadowing or spoiling? Um... Yes. And just like Robot Carnival, the level ends with Dr. Eggman saying, Don't get too excited, boys! Those were the easy ones! Eggman, you do realize there's a woman on Team Dark, right? After that, we transition to the next level, Eggfleet. I like to mention that each team starts off with a cutscene of Eggman describing his fleet of battleships, which he built himself. But it ends with an incredible shot of each team as they landed on one of the battleships. This level introduces these cannons that fire at you, which you can destroy pretty easily. It also introduces these robots that shoot pink lasers equipped with a shield. While they're not annoying in my opinion, you can actually stun it with a tornado attack as long as it doesn't use its shield. It has these fan blades that are similar to the flower in the jungle area, but there are obstacles to avoid by moving up or down. Finally, this is the only level aside from the tutorial level in which you use Rocket Excel if you're playing as Team Sonic and Team Dark. But then again, you can just run the treadmill without having to use Rocket Excel at all, given how much acceleration the speed characters already have. Which reminds me, I'm surprised we haven't talked about this sooner, so let's talk about the overall control for this game. I've mentioned in the adventure games that Sonic controls very smoothly and it's very fun to play as, with a few glitches. But this game, it feels like the developers thought that the speed wasn't fast enough, so they pretty much ramped up the speed levels to ludicrous speeds. Going fast in this game is a nail biter because there are times where I would start sliding after making a landing from a ramp. Speaking of which, if you're attacking enemies in the power formation, you're pretty much sliding all over the place. A little hint. Knuckles and Omega mostly slide forward when attacking if you're moving with the analog stick. If you keep the control stick neutral, you won't move as far while you're attacking. You can also use the power character's attacks in midair if you want to be more stationary. Also, with the speed ramped up, don't be surprised if you find yourself careening off a ledge because there are times when that will happen, especially in Hangcastle. 
I swear, you have to be perfectly in the middle to hit the ramp. Otherwise, you'll potentially miss the ramp and fall off the ledge. The control for this game definitely takes a lot of getting used to. I don't think it's that bad, but it can be very slippery at times. I personally think the characters control fine enough, but I will agree that it's not the most friendly to newcomers. Speaking as someone who got several game overs at the end of Mystic Mansion due to falling into the bottomless pit several times during my first playthrough. While I may be able to get used to the controls pretty easily, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone else can get used to it. I may think the controls work fine enough, but hey, that's just me. Going back to the Egg Fleets, this is another one of my favorite levels in the game. I really love the atmosphere of this level, in addition to just how open it is with how many different alternate pathways this level is just full of. Thinking about it now, this is probably one of my favorite final levels in the entire Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. It may be challenging at times, but I still really love this level for the most part. Though if you're playing as Team Chaotix, you have to reach the stage without being detected by the enemies. So it's basically Metal Gear Chaotix. Hey, Espio! What happened? Espio? Espio! This leads to the final normal level of the game, Final Fortress. This weather reminds me of our last attack on the egg carrier. Have you been in battle before? What? You too, Mr. B? Something's fighting! Not only does it bring back the cans from Egg Fleet as well as the rail grinding, but it also has these platforms that fall if you stand on them for too long, as well as these color lasers that all teams, except for Team Rose, have to avoid. While it's not difficult for a quote unquote final level, it can get long, especially with Team Dark and even Team Chaotix. If you're playing as Team Chaotix, you'll have to find all the keys hidden throughout the level in order to clear the mission. Fitting, considering how the most annoying missions for Team Chaotix are scavenger hunts. This leads to the supposedly final boss of the game, the Egg Emperor. And if you thought the final Eggman fight from Sonic Adventure was repetitive, then get a load of this! Yeah, get used to him saying that, because he repeats those lines throughout the entire fight. This is by far the most annoying fight in the entire game. Mostly because the Egg Emperor keeps spamming the same attacks over and over and over again. It's not the most difficult final Eggman fight in the series, but it's certainly one of the most annoying. I also recommend staying close to him if you can, otherwise he'll... Yeah, that. I would also recommend using the flight and power formations if you want to deal out the most damage, and make sure to level up the characters as fast as you can. And if you can, use Team Blast whenever possible. After a long fight, the battle is eventually over. Impossible. No! Team Sonic finally manages to defeat Eggman and save the world, and then ends with Amy chasing Sonic yet again. Prior to that, Team Rose finally manages to find both Chocola and Froggy, and Amy manages to find Sonic and chases after him yet again, after Cream notices him from a distance. For Team Dark, Omega believes to have destroyed Eggman and thus completed his mission. However, Rouge investigates this hidden facility filled with a large army of robot Shadow the Hedgehog clones. This makes her question whether or not the Shadow who was traveling with her was the same one from Sonic Adventure 2, or another one of Eggman's clones. Most of you already know the answer, considering what would come later, but yeah. Meanwhile, Team Chaotix finds out that the client who hired them was none other than Dr. Eggman himself. It turns out that the Eggman they've been fighting this entire time was a fake, and that Eggman was captured and locked up in his own base. Hey, hold on, you guys. It's no trick. And besides, I plan on paying you. You'll be rewarded handsomely for helping me. As soon as I conquer the world, I will pay you. So do they get paid when the events of Sonic Forces happen? Nah, probably not. Some nerd promised it would be And that concludes the story mode for this game. Or does it? It turns out that when you finish the game with all four teams, you'll most likely get a prompt telling you to collect all seven Chaos Emeralds. <sighs> okay, let's talk about them. So, during any of the regular stages, you can find a key hidden throughout the stage, but you'll lose the key if you take damage while holding it. Fortunately, there are multiple keys hidden throughout the stage, giving you multiple attempts to hold onto the key. If you finish a stage with the key in hand, you'll be taken to a special stage. If you get the key during the first stage of an area, like Seaside Hill or Grand Metropolis, the special stage will allow you to try and earn some extra lives. But if you get the key during the second stage of an area, like Ocean Palace or Power Plant, the special stage allows you to try and get the Chaos Emerald tied to that area. As for the special stages themselves, oh boy. In concept, these special stages are perfectly fine. 
but in execution, they're not very good. And it all has to do with one major thing, the control. If you thought the special status in Sonic 2 were bad enough, the special status in this game are a whole nother level. As previously mentioned, the overall control is all over the place, but the control is much, much, MUCH worse during the special stages. In order to collect the Chaos Emerald, you have to chase it throughout the stage and collect these orbs along the way. The more orbs you find, the faster you get. You can even boost if you have enough orbs, which you'll more than likely be doing throughout every single one of these stages. However, there are times where you'll either be running on the side, which will likely cause you to fall off and slow you down, or run into these spike bombs that will also slow you down. So in other words, if you don't manage to get the Chaos Emerald before it reaches the finish line, then the stage automatically ends. What makes the control so bad in the special stages is how slippery and finicky it is. It feels like the characters can't stay still or run in a perfectly straight line unless they're actually on a straight path. It's very easy to lose control of yourself and run into a part of the stage you don't want to. Even as someone who's gotten used to the controls, I have to admit that the controls for these special stages are very bad. That being said, if you want to get the Chaos Emeralds, make sure you get them with Team Rose since they have the shortest stages in the game, and thus are easier to get the key required to enter the special stage. So after eventually and finally collecting all 7 Chaos Emeralds, you'll be given access to the final story. It's here where we find out that the one who locked up Dr. Eggman was none other than his own creation, Metal Sonic, returning from Sonic CD. It turns out that he's been collecting data from all the other teams, and this eventually leads to an extremely long transformation sequence. Because of how long it takes, you can easily take this time to do other things while you wait if you don't want to skip the cutscene. Hey Sonic, got any birthday messages lately? Oh yeah, tons of birthday messages. Also, I'm getting an outcry from fans wanting a new adventure game. Sheesh, how long is this gonna go on? Probably forever. What's going on with you, Seth? Wait, what are you doing now? Uh, oh, hey, uh, I was just playing a level of Sonic Forces. It's about as long as Metal Sonic's transformation sequence, so yeah. <laughs> Aha! Perfect timing. I just finished the stage. Jeez, how long did that take? 43 seconds?! That's almost as long as a level in Sonic Forces! My point exactly. So after what feels like an extended loading screen, Dr. Eggman finds out that the only way to possibly defeat Mel Sonic is the power of Chaos Emeralds, which all four teams already have in their hands. But Sonic figures out that the best way to defeat Mel Sonic is the real superpower of teamwork and thus you now have to fight Metal Sonic with all four teams. First up we have Metal Madness, in which Team Rose, Chaotix, and Dark all fight against Metal Sonic in his transformed state. Metal Sonic's attacks include these spear things, blowing fire from its arm, and projectiles that can capture a team member once hit. But thankfully these projectiles can be avoided by changing into the flight formation, fly, and wait until he's done shooting projectiles. Also you see that glowing circle on Metal Sonic's chest? That shows that Metal Sonic can be invulnerable to that formation's attacks. Oh, and be sure to level up your team members as well as Team Blast if needed. After defeating Metal Sonic with Team Dark, Metal Sonic once again transforms as he begins to fly away. Team Sonic, with the power of the Chaos Emeralds, allows Sonic to transform into Super Sonic, while Tails and Knuckles, for some reason, only have these gold seals of some sort. Wait, didn't they both have a super form from Sonic 3 and Knuckles? I can understand Tails, but Knuckles? Also, I'd like to mention that Sonic Hero's main theme plays during this cutscene, but I swear in this cutscene, and this cutscene only, we can hear Johnny Giovelli saying, Tonic Heroes. This leads to the actual final boss of the game, Metal Overlord. Unlike the previous teams, Team Super Sonic can only attack Metal Sonic with Team Blast. You can build up your Team Blast by doing regular attacks on Metal Sonic. And like the adventure games, your ring counter will start depleting. So be sure to find these balloons so you can hold on to as many rings as you can while fighting Metal Sonic at the same time. After 5 Team Blast attacks, the battle is finally over. Yeah! We did it! Phew! That was pretty tough. Too bad it's all over! For you! 
Metal Sonic turns back to normal as Sonic and friends leave the premises. Knuckles chases after Rude when she mentions a certain treasure, and Team Chaos chase after Eggman after realizing that they still need to get paid. Oh, and both Shadow and Omega remain with Metal Sonic. And thus Sonic, Tails, and... Knuckles? Wait, I thought he was chasing Rouge earlier. Why is he suddenly back with Sonic and Tails? Well, either way, this leads to what is probably the cheesiest line in the entire game. Yeah! We're Sonic Heroes! And that concludes the story mode for this game. For real this time. Now, on to the other modes! First, there's Challenge Mode. Like the Adventure Games, it allows you to replay stages while at the same time give you an extra mission for each team. Team Sonic's secondary missions have you reach the goal ring under a time limit, and Team Rose has you collect 200 rings as fast as possible. Team Dark's secondary missions require defeating a certain amount of enemies as fast as possible, but Team Chaotix's secondary missions have by far the worst secondary missions in the game. For example, remember how in Seaside Hill when you had to find 10 out of 20 Hermit Crabs to finish the mission? Well, their secondary mission requires finding all 20 Hermit Crabs in the stage. Every. Single. One. Unless you're using a guide, you're probably going to take way longer to finish the stage than necessary. Another example of their secondary missions being harder is in Ocean Palace. They still need to reach the Chow at the end of the mission, but this time they also need to avoid being detected by the enemies. And speaking of which, Frog Forest and Egg Fleet's secondary missions still require reaching the goal without being detected, but this time with a time limit, so yeah. However, there is one last feature to talk about that is also returning to Adventure 2. And that is the multiplayer. Hey dude, did somebody say multiplayer? Hey, it's that surfer dog again. Long time no see. Uh, it hasn't been that long, dude. We just met a few weeks ago. Is that a point there, Sonic? Fair enough. But anyway, why are you here? Well, I did hear the gamers say multiplayer. Uh, mind if I join you for that? Sure, why not? Let's do it. Awesome, dude! Unlike Adventure 2, well, the battle version, in which you had everything unlocked from the get-go, this game requires you to unlock all the other multiplayer modes outside of Action Race. How, you may ask? By collecting emblems every time you finish a level or mission. Thankfully, you don't have to A-rank every single mission to get all the emblems. Though you still have to A-rank every mission if you want to unlock Super Hard Mode. First up, there's Action Race, in which you race against your opponents to the goal ring. Then we have Battle, which is basically the team battles from the story mode, only this time you can battle against a friend rather than the CPU. You can even create two matchups that we never saw in story mode, such as Team Song vs Team Chaos or Team Dark vs Team Rose. Next we have the special stage. It's basically the same in single player, except you're racing to get the Chaos symbol before your opponent does. Moving on, we have Ring Race, in which you have to collect more rings than your opponent before time runs out. And then we have the Bobsled Race. Oh, so that's what they're called. But yeah, you basically have to ride the bobsleds in a three lap race and finish the race before your opponent does. Moving on, we have Quick Race. It's very similar to Action Race, but this time the teams don't share the exact same layout. Instead, the stages have mirrored layouts with the goal ring being in the center of the stage. And finally, we have Expert Race. It's basically the same as Action Race, except you get to race on stages that weren't accessible in Action Race. That being said, the multiplayer for this game is pretty fun, but I do personally think it's a step down from Sonic Adventure 2, mostly because of two reasons. For starters, like Lucas said earlier, almost all of the multiplayer modes now have to be unlocked by collecting enough emblems, compared to Sonic Adventure 2, which had almost every multiplayer mode available from the start. Secondly, there isn't quite as much to choose from. Each multiplayer mode only has three stages to choose from per mode which means when it comes to the normal races, you can only play six of the 14 stages from the main story, with three of them having to be unlocked by collecting all 120 emblems. Oh man! I really wanted to race you in Hang Castle! Yeah, I guess the game had some missed opportunities. Bogus, dude. You know, it'd be awesome to see this game get re-released for today's consoles, like how Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 did. That would be awesome. Especially if it had an online multiplayer. Yeah, totally! Anyway, layer dudes! Graphically, the game looks amazing. The game took the aesthetics of the Genesis games to another level, especially the checkerboard walls in Seaside Hill. Even the casino levels look amazing despite the pinball physics. I also enjoy getting a kick out of the cutscenes, whether in game or FMVs. They're just incredible to look at. 
While I personally think the in-game character models are a step down from Sonic Adventure 2, I definitely think that Sonic Heroes has prettier environments and more creative level design. I especially love the way Bingo Highway and Frog Forest look in this game. With that said, I love this game's music. As I mentioned before, the music used in Hang Castle fits the level design very well. That also applies with the music for the other stages because, like Adventure 1, it has a variety of genres which I like. You have your rock, pop, techno, blues, it's all there. I also like the theme music for each team, especially Team Dark's theme, This Machine, and Team Chaotic's theme, simply titled Team Chaotix. In fact, the band behind Team Dark's theme, Julian K, would later do a song called Waking Up for Shadow the Hedgehog. I also don't mind Team Rose's theme, Follow Me, performed by Kay Hanley. Plus, if you watched Playhouse Disney back in 2007, then you might recognize her for singing the theme of My Friends Tigger and Pooh. Team Sonic's theme, We Can, is okay, but not as memorable as the last song Ted Poley and Tony Harnell did, Escape from the City from Adventure 2. But then we have Crush 40 singing not one, but two songs for this game, Sonic Heroes and the final boss theme, What I'm Made Of. Both these songs are incredible incredible to listen to, and I recommend you give them a listen if you haven't already. But yeah, it's one of my favorite video game soundtracks of all time, mainly because Sonic Heroes was the first 3D Sonic game I've ever played, and it starts to grow on you. So Seth, what do you think of this game's soundtrack? Sonic Heroes does have a very good soundtrack. While I personally don't enjoy it as much as Sonic Adventure 2's soundtrack, Sonic Heroes definitely still has a lot of great songs. My favorite songs being Seaside Hill, Casino Park, Bingo Highway, What I'm Made Of, and especially This Machine. And while I don't remember every song in this game, I almost always enjoy every song that plays throughout the game. Wow, you guys seem to like this game's soundtrack a lot. Oh yeah, definitely love the soundtrack. So Lucas, what did you think of Sonic Heroes overall? Well, if you were to ask me, I really love Sonic Heroes. It's one of the best 3 Sonic games I've ever played, despite having a few problems. The overall graphics are fantastic, taking almost everything from the classic games and enhancing them to a 3D environment. Plus, I can always get a kick out of these cutscenes. They're just so good! Gameplay-wise, it works really well. I like the idea of having team-based gameplay and having to play as 3 characters at once, but I wouldn't consider this game perfect by any means. While I enjoy using Thundersuit to attack enemies with a flight formation, it would have been nice to have the flight characters fly solo like in Adventure 1. And once again, the overall control can get finicky to a point where I end up losing control of who I'm playing as, but it's not as bad as the special stages. If the speed levels weren't cranked up, then I would enjoy this game even more. If this game were to be re-released, they need to fix the overall control, otherwise newcomers will have a hard time enjoying it. Overall, Sonic Heroes is a great looking game with an amazing soundtrack but mixed when it comes to gameplay. However, I'm sure it won't hinder your overall experience. So give it a try when you get a chance. Sonic Heroes is definitely one of my top 5 favorite Sonic games. It may not be perfect, in fact it still has some small issues that bother me personally, but the positives far outweigh the negatives for me. I love the levels, the gameplay, the soundtrack, and just the overall vibe this game gives. And this is a bit of a hot take, but I personally enjoy Sonic Heroes more than Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. Mostly because it has more focus on high-speed platforming compared to the previous games which had mech shooting and... fishing. Though I feel like the biggest hurdle that players may need to get over is the overall control, so I think that may end up deciding whether or not you'll enjoy it. But regardless, I do hope you at least try the game, because there's definitely something to enjoy with this gem. I really do hope that Sonic Heroes gets an HD remaster like Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 did at some point, because I would love to play this game in widescreen on modern consoles. So yeah, I really love this game. Not the best, but I still really love it. Wow! Comparing this to the Adventure 2 review, it wasn't as long as I thought it would be. Granted, while there wasn't as much to talk about, I still think Sonic Heroes is a great game whether or not it has the same features from Sonic Adventure 2. And thanks Seth for helping out. No problem, Lucas. Now if you excuse me, I'm out of here. Chaos Control! <laughs> huh. I wonder where he went off to. So I guess anyone can use Chaos Control whenever they want to. I guess so. Anyway, I better head off. Hope my friends don't get taken away by another Time Eater. Alright. Take care, Sonic. Sayonara, Fairly Odd Gamer. Sayonara to you, too. I'm 
sure we'll see him again soon enough. Anyway, I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer, and I wish you all good luck for the rest of your day or night, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. How's it going, dudes? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon if you want to get notified for upcoming videos. Also, be sure to check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as my character buddies on TikTok and video commissions. Link to those in the description below. And because it's a special review, here's Sonic to finish it off. Sonic? Thanks, gamer. If you liked what you saw and want to help support the channel, then be sure to check out the Fairly Odd Gamer on Patreon. As a supporter, you can chat with everyone who helped out, as well as other fans, have your name in the credits, and even watch some bonus content such as sneak peeks and even early showings of upcoming game reviews. With that said, it's my honor to present this month's shout out to Alexander Bone, otherwise known as Wisdom Tote. Thank you so much for watching this video, as well as supporting the channel. What comes up must come down. Yeah, my feet don't touch the ground.